in just a minute. Um, thank you all for coming out in spite of the, the rain and the floods of last week. Um, it's uh, another reminder of the important work that we're gathered here to do. And um, 350 Vermont is really uh, intentional about two things. Um, getting the just energy transition that we need um, for, you know, like solving the climate crisis as best we can in Vermont, and also building the community that we need to help each other out and keep, keep our communities resilient as these weather events get worse. And so um, I think tonight is a great example of a combination of those two. Um, we have Debbie Liu um, from Vermont Community Thermal Networks, um, which is all about how we can work to um, install this really cool, like relatively new, but tested and proven heating and cooling technology. Um, and as Debbie will talk about, um, this isn't something that we can just kind of like hand off to our utilities to do themselves and like we, we don't have to do any work. Um, it really works best when the community comes together and we work to make this like a town powered resource that gives back to all of us. So I think that's personally what's really exciting to me. Um, we were, thank you for your patience as we were setting up logistics last minute. Um, unfortunately, we don't have amplification. Um, we, we were planning on getting it, but it did not show up today. So we're going to try our best to speak loudly through the rain. If at any time you can't hear, don't be shy about like raising your hand, doing this with your ear, and we'll, we'll try our best to keep our voices elevated and loud. That's, that sound good? <laughs> okay, good. So we have bathrooms. There's one behind you, and as well as out this door, um, kind of like do a U-turn on your left. Uh, we have seltzers, and after the presentation, we, we will have some pizza and snacks. Um, so hope that you all came a little bit hungry. And if you want to learn more about 350 Vermont, we have a sign up and just information table over here. Um, you can also talk to myself, Joe over here, Andrea, Debbie, uh, Heather, Sarah. There's a bunch of people here. So introduce yourself, get to know us, and, and we're happy to chat. Um, and I'll hand it over to Debbie now. Yeah, just don't go too far because I need you to go back. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, please, if you can't hear me, as Connor said, let me know. And feel free to move up also because there are a few seats right up in front if you want them. So. Um, I've got a fair amount of information to share, but I also want to get to discussing with you what might work in Montpelier for thermal energy networks, which essentially means what we're talking about is sharing heat in our community. So that's the focus for tonight. Um, I chose this picture of Montpelier and the Langdon Street Bridge because I have spent 16 years on Langdon Street in Montpelier teaching dance at Contemporary Dance Studio a long time ago. So jazz, musical theater, tap, a little modern, that kind of thing. I taught at Montpelier High School for a while. I choreographed musicals at U32. I lived in Waitsfield for 17 years. So Montpelier was my city home in central Vermont. Now I live in South Burlington. But um, I really feel like central Vermont is my Vermont home. So thank you for welcoming me here. Uh, two years ago, I started Vermont Community Thermal Networks to put this solution on the table in Vermont. As I mentioned, I've been a teacher, and so what I'm doing is the education and advocacy needed to advance this idea and put it to work in Vermont. So the other thing I'm doing is organizing with communities to uh, find places where we can actually put this system in the ground and in buildings. So that's a question for us here tonight is, where might this be possible in Montpelier? And we can explore that together. I also want you to know that there are state and regional partners ready to work with us. So you might recognize some of these names from Efficiency Vermont all the way to um, your regional planning commission, Central Vermont RPC. There are people on staff there who know all about this and are enthusiastic and are ready to work with us and support what we might want to do here. So tonight what I'm going to do is cover the basics first to make sure we all understand what we're talking about when we say things like we're talking about moving heat. So we're going to start talking about heat and how we need to move it around. And then we're going to talk about geothermal and what that means. And then what does thermal energy networks mean? 
We're also going to talk about what's happening in Vermont with both geothermal and thermal energy networks, and then what we can do in Montpelier opportunities here and resources that we've developed to help communities do this, as Connor said, for ourselves without having to wait for big utilities to do it for us. And then we're going to talk about it some more. So heat is a big deal in Vermont because it really gets cold here. But when we're talking about heat, I'm sweating tonight. I don't know about you. So heat is something that conjures up a lot of ideas and feelings um, and different experiences for different people. And what I want to do just now is to take a minute, just one minute, to think about heat in your life and what words or phrases or images or even stories come to mind when you think about the word heat. So I want you to just turn to your neighbor or in like a group of three and just take a minute to share with each other when you think heat, what do you think, especially on a hot human night like tonight or especially when you think about Vermont winters. So just take a minute and if you're not really close to somebody, you can reach across a chair and um, have a little conversation about heat. All right, folks, when you're ready, we're going to come back. Just wind up the last thing you're saying. And I would love to have a little window into what you were talking about and the different things people think about when they think about heat. So um, I heard from Connor, he talked about his mom being a nurse and thinking about the emergency room and extreme heat. So that's one example. What else, what else was said? Anybody want to share what they heard? I was just wondering what you heard from your neighbors about heat or what you told them. Joe. Being cozy in your house near the wood stove. Right, cozy, yeah. wood stove. Those are great words. What else? Yes. I've had geothermal in my house for almost 20 years. Wow. And, yeah. um, you know, it sounds lovely. Oh, yes, you just take heat out of, the, out of the deep water and put heat back into the deep water. But you need an electric pump in the well. You need a heat pump. You need a fan to circulate the air through your ductwork. So there are a lot of um, moving parts. Okay. It's going to add to your electric bill, or somehow you have to throw out electricity. Okay. When I installed all this, um, oh, and it's expensive to install. Okay. I so mean, it costs a lot to drill a well. Da 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 da. Okay. Um, and. Um, can you just share like one more thought that we could capture up here? Sure. We've got expensive and maybe I would say complicated to summarize. Expensive, expensive and moving parts. Well, moving parts. Yeah. Oh, oh, electricity reliant. Okay. Yep. I, I, I had intended to get solar panels on my roof, mm -hmm. but then I found out that because of the way my house is positioned and oh, neighborhood trees right. and all that, that that wasn't feasible for okay. me. Well, let's hear what other people talked about when they were just talking about heat. Yes. Um, being uncomfortable in the summer. Uncomfortable, sure. And then there's cozy as well. What else did you say? Well, I, I said right off the bat that, and I've been experiencing this the last two weeks, as I've gotten older, mm -hmm. I have much less tolerance for this kind of heat and humidity. Okay. I find I don't have as much energy. I don't want to do things. Um, it's a pain to get exercise because you really get really exhausted quickly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I find myself thinking, what's it going to be like to live here? You know, yeah. If this begins to be the way it is for months and months on end. Right. So we're wondering about the impact of heat on our lives as we mm -hmm. see more and more of that. Yeah. Um, when I asked this question somewhere else, somebody said checkbook. <laughs> Did that come up with anybody yeah. else? Yeah. Like, the word expensive, yeah. no matter what kind of heat you're talking about? Yeah, were you going to suggest something? I, I was, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't mind this way. I find places to be and things to do where I can be comfortable in it. What I object to is the season where I have to burn money to stay warm. Okay, burning I hate money. That. I really hate that. Hating burning money to stay warm. I want to make sure everybody heard that. Yeah, yeah there's that too. What else? Yes. I 
I said resilience because we've taken a lot of measures in our home. We've got the solar panels, and so we are dependent on electricity. And when that goes out, we don't have heat. Right. Okay. Yeah. So resilience and dependency at the same time. Right. Anything else? Something we should make sure is captured up here? Yeah. When I think heat, I think sheet. Sheet? Yeah. As in, in your bed nice and warm? Uh, sheet. Sheet. Like sheet. Sheet. Yeah. Oh, OK. Sheet. Yeah. How so? I don't know, just the way it sounds together. OK. Rhyming? Uh, yeah. Sure. I mean, it smells similar okay. things, as well as Absolutely, too. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Having a little bit of fun with the word heat. Sure. Okay. Well, we can keep uh, talking about heat, and we also need to talk about cooling, obviously. Um, the main thing that I want to share with you is that I don't think this is news to anybody here, but that heat is a precious resource here in Vermont. And we actually are producing a lot of heat that we're not using or we use it and then we throw it away and that's a main concept of what we're talking about here so we spend a lot of time effort and money trying to make heat and move it and save as much of it as we can as people in these pictures are doing when actually here in montpelier we do have heat. And I was wondering if you could just kind of shout out the different kinds of fuels or sources of heat that are used here that you know of in Montpelier. Well, How are people heating? Big wood burning thing in the center of town. Yeah, the big wood burning thing is a district heating system. And I want to talk more about that too. But if you're not connected to that, how are you heating your building in Montpelier? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so a combination of wood and fossil fuels in the form of oil and propane. Right. Okay, so let's talk about that big thing in Montpelier that some big buildings are connected to, the district energy system. On the left, you can see this is what it looked like going in the ground. There's a big trench and there are pipes underground. And those pipes are insulated pipes because they're carrying hot water or steam that's high temperature. And this is how it's different from what I'm going to share with you. On the right, this is pretty much all you can see now because everything else is underground or inside buildings. This is the facility that receives the big trucks of wood, wood chips, whatever it is, and burns it and the smoke goes up the stack <clears throat> and the hot water steam goes to buildings from this central place. Is that right in Burlington? <coughs> no, that would be McNeil, the McNeil yeah. plant. That is in Burlington, but this is the Montpelier Biomass Central Plant for the district heating system. Right by motor vehicles. Yeah, it's right by the river, right? I've always seen the smokestack, but I didn't realize what it was until recently. So just a couple of things to know. District energy essentially means using local resources to meet community needs through a community scale energy system. Okay, the system in Montpelier is in particular a district heating system, which uses a central plant, the picture you saw with the big smokestack, to supply heat and hot water, high temperatures, to many buildings throughout the community. And so this is what it says about it on the website, that buried hot water or steam pipes distribute heat from the central plant to customers, to buildings. Each customer pays only for what they use, and it's a lot like a municipal water system. So hang on to those ideas because they're going to come back. So that's fine, but what about cooling, right? So some people have air conditioning, some people don't. Some people rely on a box they stick in their window. But we're all going to need a lot more cooling for a lot more of the year in case you haven't noticed. So heating and cooling are both needs that we have. And we can do heating and cooling with a kind of heat pump called a ground source heat pump. And this is the building block of a thermal energy network. So I want to make sure we all understand what is meant when we say a ground source heat pump. It's also called a water source heat pump. So like an air source heat pump, a, a ground source heat pump is a 
box in the basement of this house, for example, that compresses temperature or takes temperature from the building and moves it outside. So it brings temperature in and it throws temperature out and it compresses it into the temperature that you want inside. So in the winter, when you need heat, it takes temperature from outside the house coming in those pipes into the basement from the ground to the heat pump in the basement. It compresses it and it distributes the heat throughout the house. In the summer, the process reverses. So it takes heat from the house and puts it back into the ground and that makes the house cooler. It brings cooler temperature in and circulates that inside. So all of that temperature comes from the ground. In Vermont, under the frost line, at about the depth of a water well, the temperature is a constant about 50 degrees year round. So that's a moderate temperature and it's constant and it's right underneath our feet. Is that about five feet? Oh no. Well, what, some plus like a water well is where you can access it, but you can actually get to that temperature about five or six feet under and, um, and access that through pipes underground that are more like in a coil system. We can talk about different forms that this takes. So it can happen different ways. This is a water one, yes. Oh, okay. So they're in these pipes that go down and then back up is mainly water. And that water absorbs the temperature of the ground and it pumps it up into the house and into the ground source heat pump where it's compressed into temperature that you want inside or it takes temperature you don't want inside and moves it back underground. So that's an important storage element which is part of these systems. So this kind of system works really well for a larger building because these heat pumps are lower maintenance and less, um, uh, less in operational costs than air source heat pumps. Um, and I'll explain more about that in a bit, but for a school or a municipal buildings, uh, these are really wonderful systems for places where taxpayers are paying a lot of money for the building and don't want to spend a lot of money over time for maintaining their heating and cooling. This is what it looks like. The heat pumps could be a box and some pipes up in the ceiling of a building that could be covered by ceiling tiles and you don't even know it's there. Or in your basement or a mechanical room, the box on the right, that's the heat pump. And it's compressing temperature and distributing it. Another part of the system are the pipes. These are the pipes that go down into the ground but also can connect buildings horizontally. And I'll talk more about that as well. These are durable plastic pipes, and you can see they're varying diameters depending on the system, the size of the system. So those are the components. And when you put these together, ground source heat pumps in buildings, pipes connecting them, you can network this system and create a loop. So you can start small, and then you can start expanding it to include other buildings. And this can happen over time. You don't have to do everything at once, but a network can be built. Now, this is where I need your help because there are so many benefits of using this kind of heating and cooling system. And I've handed out some cards with these words on them. And I need reminding of what all of these words are. And then I can tell you a little bit more about each one. So I want to start with any card that has a green word on it. Can anybody give me a green word? Okay. Thank you. Clean, right. These systems are clean because they don't cause greenhouse gas emissions. Any emissions will come from the electricity that's required for the pumps. So depending on the kind of electricity you're using, it could be very clean or it could emit some emissions. If you're using solar, with the system you could get pretty close to 100% emission free heating and cooling. What's another green word? Healthy. So nothing is burned inside, which makes indoor air safer to breathe than if you're burning wood or burning a fossil fuel. And I think there's one more grain word. Safe. Safe, right. There aren't toxic leaks, and there's no risk of explosion from these systems because it's mainly water in the pipes. Now, other words that are out there. What do you have, anybody? <gasps> okay. 
Joe has efficient, and I'm going to ask anybody who has an efficient card to hang on to it. Let's go to Mary Alice and just. Right. So people who work on gas systems or deliver oil or propane, those are fossil fuel workers. They're also essentially plumbers and pipe fitters. Those are the skills we need to install these systems. So without very much retraining, those people who have family sustaining wages and good jobs can start doing this work instead of working with fossil fuels. So this can be part of a just transition off of fossil fuels. Another word, what else do we need? Affordable, right. So this is a solution that can be available to many people at once. And I'm gonna talk more later about how we can use a utility model to pay for these systems gradually over time and therefore customer bills can stay low and reasonable and always the same year round because we're not paying for different global markets and what happens to fossil fuels on global markets. So they can be affordable. We'll talk about financing them later. What else? Oh. Another card. Flexible, right. So these systems, because they're inside and underground, can fit in with the natural landscape that is so important in Vermont, and also can fit in with the historic character of our downtowns. And we don't have to have compressors outside of buildings and that kind of thing. So they can really fit in lots of different places with a minimal footprint. What else? Local, right. So the heat that we're talking about is coming from the ground under our feet, or from other buildings around us, and we'll talk about that more as well. And we can also keep our energy dollars local and not have to send them out of state to fossil fuel extractors and producers and generators. So it's a very local heating and cooling system. What else? Secure. Secure, right. Okay, so there's a few of these words that relate to the fact that these systems are underground and inside. So that means that they're not as likely to be susceptible to disruption of various kinds. And as I mentioned, they're also not susceptible to the rise and fall and the peaks and drops in fossil fuel prices from global markets. What else? Oh, question? Yeah, um, thinking about secure. Yeah. Um, I notice in your diagrams that the functioning part of the system is in the basement. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. And probably will continue to. Is there a way to do this without putting those essential components Definitely. in the base? Yeah, like I showed, they can go in the ceilings. Okay. They can go on upper floors, just like um, other boilers are moving up. Luckily, when you're moving this kind of mechanical equipment up, you're not burning in living spaces. So that makes it much more attractive. Yeah. Yeah, these systems are closed loops, so you charge them with water, and then you never have to refill them with water, so it's not using water well, to circulate the temperature. There are closed loop systems and there are open loops. Correct, yes. I haven't gone to open loop. We're going to talk about Champlain College in a minute. Yes? Where is your source of heat to get groundwater temperature 50 degrees up to 70 or 75 degrees? The ground source heat pump compresses the temperature from the 50 degrees coming in and it, into the, say, 70 degrees you want inside your home. You mean it takes it out of the yes. water itself? Yes, it extracts it from the water and it compresses it, makes it a, a hotter temperature and distributes it through your building. Yes. Yeah, that's part of, that's coming, and so short answer for now and more information later. Ground source heat pumps work better than air source heat pumps more efficiently during the coldest and the hottest days. So yes, they are definitely up to the task, as are many cold climate air source heat pumps, really. Um, so are there any words that I haven't covered? Reliable, right. 
So because these systems are highly efficient, they don't have to work as hard as air source heat pumps. They use less electricity and they last longer. So a heat pump could last 25 years or more. The pipes underground are gonna last at least 100 years. Anything I forgot? Efficient. Efficient, I'm gonna get to that later. And resilient, yes. So we talked about being able to move the heat pumps up out of basements and because there aren't outside components, they are less susceptible to disruption from extreme weather and other events. Yes? Question about the just. Yeah. Um, I would, the, the being able to retrofit jobs actually awesome. Um, but being a closed loop system, loop system that does not need continuous maintenance, what happens once the system is set to the input? Okay, so the question is about maintenance and jobs. Are there really jobs if it's a low maintenance system? And yes. First of all, we need to install a lot of these in a lot of places, so that's a lot of work right off the bat for years and years to come. And they do need maintenance, so if they are low maintenance rather than no maintenance, so they do need checking on and tuning up. Okay, so I'm just going to continue here and we'll get to efficient in a little bit. There are many of these systems working in Vermont, and this is a partial list of some of the systems that are already installed. And you don't have to read every single word here to understand that there are lots of different kinds of buildings, businesses, organizations, farms, museums, schools that have these systems that are working in them. And there are many more coming online, like Burlington High School is a big new project. Yes? Are any of them networked? Good question. Champlain College campus and Hula Lakeside, the two at the top, those are networked. And I'm going to talk about Champlain. Great question. So here's Champlain College. Um, Champlain College's system has been working since 2008. And they started small. And now there are multiple buildings connected. And the thing to know about their system is not just that it's working, but also that they have new construction, like these buildings you see here. And they also have old historic homes that have been converted into dorms and classrooms and administrative buildings. And those are also part of the network. So this shows that you can have new construction and you can have old buildings both part of the same network. And it's working. And yes, it's an open loop system, which is much more possible in Burlington than a lot of other places in Vermont because of how the water flows underneath Burlington. And an open loop system can be less expensive, but also more complicated because it's going to suck things up from underground and will need more maintenance. So I tend to, to focus more on closed loop systems that we're likely to have around Vermont rather than a lot of what Burlington is doing. Um, and I'm throwing in another example that is not in Vermont, but is from a rural community in Iowa. This is West Union, Iowa, and it's a town of about 2,700 people. And it is a county seat. You can see how rural it is if you look beyond. The building in the middle is the courthouse. And they decided to put a geothermal system in their courthouse, and they started drilling. And the businesses around said, well, what about us? Can't you send us a pipe? We can't drill our own systems. So they installed the pipe, the municipality, the city government <laughs> installed pipe underground and connected people to the system. At the same time, they also updated their streets to allow for pedestrian and bike safety and slowing traffic and make it much more walkable. So this was part of a downtown revitalization project that has made their town much more attractive to many people and much more vibrant. And so the geothermal network that they have is part of that. Now, we talk a lot about the energy coming from the ground, and we talk about geothermal. But there are other places we can capture and reuse heat. And one is from wastewater. So think about it. Think about the water that you use in your home every day. Think about what a hospital or a hotel might use. And a lot of that water, we're warming up. And then we flush it down the drain and it's gone. We can capture that temperature either at the building, outside of the building from a sewer line, or at the wastewater treatment plant. There's a heck of a lot of heat there. And we can send it back into buildings to heat water again, 
or if there's enough heat to actually heat and cool the space by using the heat or rejecting heat into that wastewater flow without touching the waste part of it, but just by capturing the temperature. The other source is waste heat from buildings. If you think about a grocery store and all of the walls of refrigeration and freezing that they have there, they have to cool stuff inside, so they have to get rid of the heat somewhere. And mostly it's going out fans and cooling towers on top of or behind their buildings. And if you think about an ice arena, they're trying to make ice inside, so they have to reject heat. So there's a lot of heat leaving a lot of different kinds of buildings that we have. You can see some examples. Well, there are ways to capture that heat and send it back into buildings or share between buildings. So that's another way we're wasting heat right now, but we can repurpose it. So this is how it could look in a Vermont town. So you've got the supermarket over there from the fans on top of the building. They're contributing waste heat into the system. A bunch of buildings are contributing heat from their wastewater. And then under the town green, that's the geothermal bore field where there are a lot of holes drilled in one place, one central place, and then it's covered back over. And you don't even know it's there, but it's contributing that moderate, constant, stable ground temperature to the whole system. Yeah? Is a bore field a series of wells? Or you just yes. Big holes and you put the pipe down in the soil? It's a series of separate wells that would have a pipe going down and back up. And then over here, there'd be another one with There's a pipe. water in the well. It's water in the pipe. So what we're trying to do is get down to where the temperature is rather than accessing water underground. It's just soil. It's, it's just soil, which is this. Yeah, so the soil has the temperature, and we're capturing that with the water the through the pipes. pipes. Down that have water in. Yes, exactly. How well, it depends on the geology and all of that. So there, I say about the depth of a water well, 400 to 800 feet generally, something like that. Um, so yeah, they don't like you to say wells when you talk about geothermal. They want you to say bores and bore fields and boreholes. So that's the language. So just to review, thermal energy networks, which is what we're talking about, use heat that already exists across a community, has already been paid for in many cases, and would otherwise be discarded and can be used efficiently. So who has a card that has efficient on it? because now is your time. Yes, I put out so many efficient cards because these systems are so highly efficient. And I wanna talk about why. So on this, the top here is an air source heat pump, which uh, this is an air source heat pump illustration in other words. So an air source heat pump when it's zero degrees or below or 90 degrees or above, like it kind of feels like right now, an air source heat pump has to work harder to get to, let's say, 70 degrees inside. That's a big difference in temperature. I've talked about that a little bit already. A ground source heat pump is starting with 50 degrees, or if it's heat from wastewater, that's going to be more like 70 degrees or something like that. So a ground source heat pump has to work, doesn't have to work as hard and uses less electricity to get to that comfortable inside temperature which is why they last longer, and it means that we're using heat that we already have rather than relying on electricity alone. We're diversifying our energy sources, and we're not just having to build out wires and poles and electricity everywhere to get rid of fossil fuels. So this is a really important part of the equation to decarbonize our buildings. Now, I wanna say, really importantly, Thermal energy networks are a yes and solution. And what I mean by that is that the yes part is a yes about air source heat pumps. We need them. We need them a lot and quickly in a lot of buildings in Vermont because there, aren't, there are many places where buildings aren't close enough to share heating and cooling. And air source heat pumps can work really well. So we need to implement these house by house solutions as quickly as we possibly can and where it is possible, try to implement thermal energy networks where it's most cost effective and where it actually works. So we wanna be able to do both. Thermal energy networks are shared infrastructure much the way a water or wastewater system is. And this is how we can make them affordable 
because our cities and towns, most of them, provide us with water and wastewater services, and we didn't pay for the whole system. We're paying our share when we pay our bills regularly. And that's how a thermal energy network can work because it's water and pipes. Now, a lot of Vermont energy committees and communities are exploring doing thermal energy networks. And what they're finding is that this is actionable in a way that expanding the electric grid isn't. Like there's not much we can do in our communities locally to make sure we all have enough electricity. But we can access our own heat and cooling locally by doing this. And I just want to quickly share with you what some Vermonters are saying. One has said the technology is straightforward and well established. Small groups of people can actually do this. It's achievable. And someone else has said, I like that we're not replicating something prepackaged. We're asking questions, learning, and implementing it ourselves. So people are more willing, more receptive. Our town has agency. And this is where I want to ask Joe, who's offered to share a little bit of his experience from Northfield about what they're looking at. Hey, I'm Joe. Uh, I'm on the Northfield Energy Committee, and we have been exploring thermal energy networks in Northfield. Um, 350 actually got me in touch with Debbie, and she gave a presentation to our committee. And we're looking for an item to explore the new leadership in our group. And so we started exploring it. And now in September, we're having a workshop in town, um, which basically is inviting all of the st uh, stakeholders, um, select board, um, business owners to, to learn about thermal energy networks and you know, get this item on the table and you know, get businesses and local government sort of planning around this idea to increase the resilience of our town. Um, Debbie's group has been really great at um, making these big steps seem more attainable. You know, you're at the you're at the like bottom of this mountain looking up, and it seems like you'll never be able to climb it. But the, she has been creating guides and PDFs about step by step, kind of like the way to implement this thing. And we've just been kind of going down the path and and going for it and. So yeah, we're really excited about our workshop. We're really excited to get um, businesses on board. And we have a lot of heat resources in Northfield. We've got Darn Stuff Socks. They make water, uh, hot water that I don't know what they do with. Hopefully they find out at the workshop. Um, we have bakeries, we've got breweries, all that make a lot of hot water. And um, um, we're really excited about it. Yeah, great. Does anybody have questions for? Yeah. I'm just curious. Is Norwich involved at all? Norwich is part of the whole. You know, they have an ice rink. Right. Um, but yeah, we are. We're in touch with Norwich about it, and we've invited them to the workshop. Are they showing interest? They are. Uh, okay. They they already have been. I don't know all the details about it, but they've already been exploring uh, geothermal for their campus. Okay. Um, so, tying it all together. Yeah. Um, is it, uh, are you primarily looking at the commercial buildings or are neighborhoods also looking at the uh, I live in the village of Northfield, so very much so I'd love to, to have the community attached to the network. But, um, and what Debbie has kind of laid out is you have to start somewhere. Yeah. You have to get one stakeholder on board or you have to get the town really on board and part of their uh, sustainability development plan. And so if Norwich is the tip of the spear, then it's Norwich. If it's you know, a, a certain development project to make it, uh, build housing, if that, you know, if we can get that connected to maybe another you know, business, then that's you know, the beginnings of the network. And that's kind of how we, we've been having to think about it instead of you're thinking about the whole town, connecting the whole town all at once. Maybe, maybe it's replacing a water line in town is the first step. You know, you know, laying pipe um, and getting getting it just part of the town plan. Um, yeah. Any other questions? So yeah. what, are, what are the costs associated with this? How do you think about it? how much do you need to do the first step? Uh, well, I think. 
a lot of the costs are um, if you're building a new building, you have to think about you know the costs of putting in an oil furnace and burning oil, or the cost of the investment of maybe a geothermal system, or you know maybe it's a cost savings if you're using the waste heat from an industry. Now now that business can actually they have a resource that they can they can profit off of. So they, they, they might be very you know interested in, in getting that as well as you know cheaper heat for the for the, the housing project or whatever's going on. So um, you know all energy is expensive um, but they can uh, yeah. Can I, can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So these, because this is infrastructure, we're talking about equipment and pipes and drilling and digging. <clears throat> this is an infrastructure project that's going to cost a million millions of dollars overall and over time. So that's why we're using utility models to make it possible for customers to pay this back gradually. Also, we're working with infrastructure investment firms that can loan money and help these projects be developed, but that ha offer a lower cost of capital because they're mission aligned with communities. There are infrastructure investment firms, especially from Europe, that are interested in the North American market. So they're very curious about us and they're interested in how they can leverage funds that they can collect to help us develop these systems here and pay them back over time, like over 20 or 30 years. And as Joe was saying, there are ways that these systems can generate revenue by buying and selling heat, and that revenue can benefit towns and cities. Yeah? I just wanted to ask about, does it matter whether you're on a high plane, like Norwich, the university is up fairly high, and the city is down lower, and I'm thinking of Montpelier, you know? of the college and down here, does it matter where you start with something like this? It doesn't matter. What you'll be wanting to figure out and discuss with engineers is the energy and the money, therefore, it would take to pump something uphill if that's needed. So if you have a city on a hill and your wastewater treatment plant is down here, that maybe is not the ideal resource to start with. You might want to start with the sock factory that's up here <coughs> instead. But it is a consideration. But in terms of drilling, it really doesn't matter. You just have to try drilling and see what you get. Yeah. So, your name. Mark, Mark uh, and I were talking earlier about physics. Physics, OK. The physics of this is something that seems to me we're not talking about. And it's, I think it's going to be a concern at some point. Um, a heating system that burns propane or heating oil or something like that uses electricity simply as an enabler. Very, very little electricity goes mm -hmm. into it. A heating system that produces heat from electricity, like resistance, uses a lot of power. Correct. A heat pump is kind of in between. It takes about 30% roughly, as I understand it of the electricity to run a heat pump as it takes to just simply produce the heat with a resistance type system. But it's a lot more than what it takes to run, to just enable a fuel burning system. So we're talking about converting to, you know, vast swaths of the country, I presume, mm -hmm. to heat pumps at a time when we're trying to shut down nuclear plants, we're trying to shut down coal plants, and at a time when the water line Hoover Dam is at an all-time low. And I just read that the US started shipping electricity to Canada because they're mm -hmm. having trouble generating up there because their water supplies are low. Mm -hmm. So, and that also we want to start powering our automobile trucks, trains, and airplanes by electricity. So the question is, we can't hear. where is all this electricity going to come from? I'm, I'm, I'm all for electric, but right. uh, so how are we going to do this? It's a really important and good question, and it's a big question. 
And that would take a lot of discussing around answering that question. And I'd love to talk about that afterwards so that we can get to talking about Montpelier and opportunities here for this kind of system. But you're right, it's complicated and how are we gonna do this? And this is one piece of the puzzle. So thank you for asking that and let's talk about that some more. Um, yes, Mark. Um, so this sounds like something, I don't know, I think this word is a little bit cliche, but it seems a little more grassroots than what our system is built on, right? So <laughs> we, we're very dependent on oil companies right now, unfortunately. But something like this seems like, I, I wish I had a better word, but it's more grassroots. We could do it on our own. Is there, has there been a lot of resistance, corporate resistance, corporate slash political? Great question. In Vermont, no. Um, I think it's also early days in the United States for there to be resistance to this. But there certainly could be resistance from fossil fuel companies that don't want people heating or cooling well, their homes without paying them and their shareholders. Yeah, it's a big question so too. Let's do it. I'm all Let's do it. Okay, <laughs> I think um, maybe two more questions and then I'm just going to finish up and we'll talk about Montpelier. Go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to mention that with all, with all the ones you listed that are already using this technology, mm -hmm. there's got to be a lot of information about the pros and the cons. And that's really important yeah. and a step that can um, answer many of these questions, or you know, fill in those fill in those gaps of information for people. And and I would hope that would be really collected well, the pros and the cons. And uh, one that the man in front was saying, right, is the the cost of, of this X compared to this other thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't hear it all, but yeah. asking that question. And I would think from all those places and all the information that's already being generated by actual use, I'm yes. hoping a lot of a lot of the issues can can be understood better. I think you're making two really important points. One um, maybe partially could be answered by case studies that are on the website that I have set up, and there's a QR code and a link on this information over here to go look at more case studies like Champlain College. And there's information there about the Hula system that's in Burlington. You can look at that. They're not highly detailed, but yes. And we also need to make sure we're really addressing what's great about these and what are some of the issues with them. So we're not making this into some kind of silver bullet because it's not. There's nothing that's going to be perfect and is going to save us. <laughs> and too, I hope that people can not bypass uh, energy efficient housing, you know, the insulating and, yes. and all the things that you can do that are going to tremendously reduce the amount of wasted energy we do. You're so right. Weatherization is a key part of making these systems efficient, just like it is for air source heat pumps as well. Thank you. Um, this uh, it kind of requires a, a high degree of community buy-in. And I'm wondering how familiar you are with uh, the Montpelier heat thing, with the, the wood burning bio. The district the heating biomass. system? Yes, yeah. yes, because I don't know a lot about it, but I kind of hear that there hasn't been the degree of buy-in that was um, proposed or anticipated when the system was developed um, and that there's more capacity than there is use. And using that as a starting point, thinking about then how to propose a system like this, which in many ways is similar. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I would say that it doesn't need a lot of community buy-in buy if you have a sock factory and a grocery store and a new housing complex, for example, those three entities could decide that they're going to do it. And they could figure out how to manage that themselves. They could involve the municipality in that, and then that takes more buy-in. The bigger you make it, the more buy-in you need. And that's something I want to talk about when I get to the resources we have, about how to generate that and help people understand this. But yeah, the district heating system in Montpelier, there are things to learn from it. There are things to emulate from it. 
it's complicated, and I don't know enough about it to speak about it myself. Yeah? When it starts small, there's technology to make it expand. That yeah. is, you need to know from the outset how you'll build in the capacity to expand. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes and no. In other words, if for each system you have a pipe that has enough connection points to expand, then you're, you're good to go to expand the system. If you've done your drilling and it's just the drilling you need for these six buildings here and you want to expand it, you might need to do more drilling. Gotcha. But if there's an ice arena that's being added, that might take a lot of the load. So, so you know, on your, yeah. on your engineers will tell you it depends. And that's infuriating sometimes and frustrating. But yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Nice. So there are different ways that this could expand. But the principle is, in Vermont, we're taking this and starting it small in order to make it doable along the lines of what Joe described. That's one principle. There are two more, and that we are trying to allow as much local control as possible, which gets at what you said about corporations that are used to controlling our energy and how much we pay and where that money goes. We're trying to make these into local systems that benefit us here. We are also working on contributing to other local goals. So here you see housing. There is an urgent need across Vermont. And the new construction, the density that's being created by adding new housing to our downtowns, that's the perfect opportunity to use that for thermal energy networks, to include them. Expanding our water and wastewater systems, there's been a huge focus on this with federal money coming into the state to create these systems or expand them or bring them back after flooding, that's the perfect, perfect time to lay some more pipes and start sharing that heat. And then, of course, we're all trying to be more resilient. And so as we work on resilience, we can think about where installing this infrastructure is going to help with that. So I have three last things to share with you, which are resources we have. The first is a very simple getting started resource, which is on our website. And essentially, it asks six questions. You can get together with a small group of people and look around and ask who can help us, who can support this idea, what's already happening in our town this could fit in with, where do we have heat, who needs that heat, and then there are six actions that go with them of things you can do. Get people together, check your town plan, check with your town clerk about what's going on, and make an inventory of what your resources are locally. The other is a much more dense and complex toolkit but laid out and hopefully in plain language to be understandable to help people figure out how to get started, how to identify opportunities. There's stuff in here about ownership and financing and also sort of what to expect when you're expecting a thermal energy network, if you know what I mean. Like, what is this project going to look like when it gets underway? So that's another resource, and I can talk more about that if you have questions. And these are the different components of that. And then we have a workshop guide. Joe mentioned they're hosting a workshop in Montpelier. And we have a guide to, North. sorry, North, you're Northfield, you're Montpelier, right. OK, um, there, it's a step-by-step -step talking you through with templates for invitations and the agenda and all of that. So we can develop a workshop with you. Yes? The website is on the materials. Yes, it is, yeah. Um, and so I'm just going to leave you, essentially, where we started, was that, which is that heat is a precious resource, but that we have a lot of the heat we need, and we have opportunities to harness it. So as Montpelier is looking to recovery and resilience, and you have a commission now that is charged with this, and a two-year full-time staff person named John Copans, who is heading up the effort with the commission, I talked to him today about this, you have an opportunity to think about how you might integrate this into things that are already happening and needs you already have. So that's what I want to share with you. Lots of questions. I don't think you've had a chance yet. We have a municipal heat. You know, we have, tell me what it's called. District heating system. We have the district heating system. Is it possible to retrofit that to be geothermal instead of biomass? My understanding is that, yes, the best practices out there nationally are that there are steam and hot water high temperature systems that are transitioning to these low temperature 
thermal energy networks. It doesn't necessarily mean the same pipes can be used because I showed you the insulated pipes that might need to be changed. Um, and then we need the different, the, instead of the central heating plant, we need ground source heat pumps in buildings or there could be a different kind of central heating plant, central plant. But it is worth looking into. It's happening in Rochester, New York, where they actually have a co-op that is providing heat to the city. And that co-op is transitioning off of steam to one of these thermal energy networks. It's also happening in Jamestown, New York. Oh, sorry, sorry, here and then back over here. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about Vermont College, which is currently in the process of essentially being purchased by Greenway. Well, I can't remember the rest of their name. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a school. Institute. I don't. Yes. Yes. If you're if you're familiar with that. Yeah. And many of those buildings already have shared heating, and so I'm thinking. And and as a matter of fact, this occurred to me when I was at a neighborhood meeting with them. Mm -hmm. Well, last week, I think. Um, so they already have some buildings that have shared heat systems. Yes. So it seems to me the concept is kind of already there. And um, I talked, there was uh, a guy uh, who's in charge of that stuff, that okay. engineering, I don't know what you would call it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, have you thought about It okay. wasn't very receptive, and I, and I said, well, and he raised the question of cost. And I said, so, well, I don't know, what do you figure it would cost to, mm -hmm. to make a geothermal system? And I don't know whether he's familiar with your concepts or not. Uh, he said, oh, $12 million. Oh, you know, back of the envelope, you just, you know, out mm -hmm. of the air kind of thought, and he didn't seem very interested. So, I mean, it would just be an ideal starting point, and there's, and there's, um, the, you know, community housing all around the campus. Exactly. Yes, it is an interesting opportunity, and other people in Montpelier have said to me, have you thought about VCFA up there on the hill? Um, and I've met the director of Greenway very briefly, and the thing about this is that it's a campus, much like the Champlain College system that I showed you yeah. before, and could be a single owner, which makes it really easy to make decisions and move a project forward. Right. And the Inflation Reduction Act is going to give anybody 30% off of the system. Whether you're a tax-paying entity or not, you will get 30% off of this system. The components all qualify. You might actually get bonuses of up to 10% off of the equipment if it's domestically manufactured, and guess what most of it is. If you meet prevailing wage requirements, that's another bonus. So the investment, the Inflation Reduction Act is making this a no-brainer with a very short return on investment time for businesses, single owners, private entities, and also benefits municipalities as well. So it is an important thing to think about, and people in Montpelier could ask Greenway Institute more about that. Oh, I already have. Yeah, <laughs> and, and there's others who are asking them. Keep yeah, keep asking. Because Maybe. my property abuts theirs, ah. so I'd be happy to tie it. Excellent. <laughs> so, my own, you know, little thing. Yeah, sure. Well, I just wanted to put up a map of Montpelier. It's obviously very small for some of the the areas we might want to talk about, but um, you can see Hunger Mountain Co-op. They've got refrigeration. Um, I just heard today that the rec center on Berry Street may be getting a geothermal system. What's the it's the, the, it's a municipal building. It's the rec recreational center on what, Berry Street. What, what did you say about it? Oh, that I heard they're getting a geothermal system, but I'm not, that's just what I heard. So okay. what's nearby that could connect there's a, <laughs> there's a laundromat. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, we've just had the floods, and they had them, we've had them for a long time, so getting closer. It seems to me before it, it's wonderful and everything, but that's going to be a major influence on where it goes and how where you know what is done, because that really needs to be mitigated for, for the whole for the whole area. So Montpelier, I, my impression is Montpelier is having a 
big discussion about what happens along the river and with the river and all of that. There are other areas of town, like the Country Club Road, Elks Club area, that has been described as a possible residential development, um, and people have asked about thermal energy network there. Um, so it doesn't have to be you know, stuff just around the river, but what else is happening in Montpelier? Yes. Um, I believe I'm aware of systems that instead of drilling into the ground uh, uh, to use um, a body of water yes. on the lake, and so I don't know how large a body of water you need, and I don't know and, and wonder whether you do, whether you can use moving water such as a river. You can. Um, it depends, again, and the environmental regulations in Vermont have not yet contemplated that, so that I know of. So the Nashville, Tennessee airport is heated and cooled, the entire airport, by water from a nearby quarry. They have the Nashville airport? Nashville. Yeah. So they sunk plates that absorb temperature into that quarry, and they use that for the whole airport. And there are two airports that do this with surface water. There are buildings that use a stormwater retention pond outside for heating, cooling their whole facility. Killington Ski Resort has a snowmaking pond right outside their big hotel. And they have been asked, would they use that for heating and cooling? So yes. Yes. Yeah. And we also talked about, you don't have to drill. You can put sort of, if you took a slinky and you stretched it out, there are pipes that do that, and you can put those six feet underground and capture the temperature that way. Or you can go back and forth with pipe like this and spread it out and capture temperature like that without drilling. So there are lots of different applications. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you know of the Berlin Pond up here. They're putting in a whole new housing development up there, mm -hmm. right near it. And I wondered whether they could use Berlin Pond for something like that. I don't know. It's a really good question. And one thing that we're finding is that we need to get in early in these discussions about new housing or other things that are happening, because this takes a bit of time to figure it out and all of that. Um, so it's important if you see something coming to start asking questions about what's possible down the road rather than something that is about to be built or um, already permitted. Would the granite quarries in Barrie and Graniteville be too yeah. far away from the you know, population the town or the population center? To look at a map. I don't know. And generally, what we say is if there, something. Many of them and they're deep. They're yeah. They're if deep. something is within a quarter of a mile, that's worth con fi figuring out if that would work. Mm -hmm. So you can be thinking a quarter of a mile away or so. And again, it depends. I want to pause here before we finish up. Some people might be ready for pizza if it's coming soon. Um, and just see if there's somebody who hasn't asked a question or shared a thought an idea about Montpelier, who would like to? Yes. I want to talk about heat thermal out of, out of the ground, or putting hot air or in, into the ground. And I was told you need is a whole big source of water that would absorb that heat or provide that heat. And that is, it was amazing when you look at the, the math, how much you need to take the water out of those pipes and disperse it into the ground or take heat from the ground. You need a big area to keep it coming into the structure. Um, I, I'd be interested in where you get your, where, where your uh, transfer is. So, but the other question is, <clears throat> The circulation, if you have a circulation, does each structure along that circulation pipe, and the pipe is flowing at 50 degree water, right? So each structure has its own little half of 50 degree water, and then it heats it up by uh, running it through a heat discharge? Through a heat pump, yes. There's, there's more than one model for this. It's possible to have a central heat exchanger 
and then people receive the temperature that they want through hotter water, but it makes more sense in Vermont applications in particular to have heat pumps in each building that can take the moderate temperature and compress it into what's needed. Um, but if I could address what you were talking about using, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying this correctly, what you meant, but it would take a lot of water to be able to capture enough heat. Or if you take a lot of heat out of the ground, the ground then becomes colder and you could run out of heat. Is that sort of what you were getting at? Yeah. Yeah, that is an issue and that is what engineers address. That is their job, to make sure that a system is designed not to deplete, not to exceed the resources it's pulling from. So a well-designed system is not going to do that. There are ways to recharge the ground. They do this in the Netherlands with solar panels. They put coils on the back of a solar panel so that when it's hot, it will pull the heat off of it and send it into the ground to warm the ground up so that there will be more warmth underground to pull from. So solar thermal is something that can complement a geothermal bore field and make sure you always have that moderate temperature that you need. So that's one way to address it. But you're right, you can change the temperature of a body of water if it's not big enough and you're pulling a lot of heat out of it. So that's one thing to be careful with. Yeah, sure, it comes less possible to use. Right. So tell me how, you, I have one of these efficiency cards. How is this water transfer of heat more efficient than air, the heat pump we've been buying? It's not so much the water or the air, it's where the heat is coming from, where the temperature comes from. These water-based systems are pulling temperature either from underground or from where it's being made at about 70 or more degrees, where we're already making it. The air source heat pumps are just pulling from the air. So we are at the mercy of the weather and the temperature outside. So that's, it's not so much the water or the air, it's where the temperature comes from. Right. That's the issue. Um, I think maybe I shall, I'll take one more question and then we'll break and I'm, I'm gonna stick around and we can keep talking. If that's good, we've been sitting for a while. Okay. I was just gonna comment that the heat, the greater the temperature, temperature differential, the greater the heat pump has to work. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if it's 30 below zero outside, you have an air source heat pump, and you wanna keep it 70 inside, you've got 100 degrees we have to maintain. Yes. But if the heat pump is using its ground source and it's 50 degree temperature underground and you want to maintain 70 house, you only have a 20 degree temperature differential to maintain it. My answer is Yes, question. exactly. And I was sharing that graphic that, is, that tries to show that. And that's in our toolkit that you can find on our website. So I guess in conclusion, what I'd like to say um, first is that I want to thank 350 Vermont and the Montpelier Node for hosting this as well as the UU Church. And I hope that <clears throat> you will continue the conversation and think about what you might want to do here in Vermont. Talk with 350 Vermont Node, the Montpelier Node and the church community here and see if you might want to organize something, if you might want to talk with members of your commission about what they're talking about, how this might fit in. And finally, I just want to say thank you for showing up and for sitting here and sweating and listening and talking and asking great questions and um, for thinking about this with me and with a lot of other people around Vermont. So thank you.